talk is going to be about Mendelian randomization today. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be um, uh, so Mendelian randomization is quite technically involved. But what I'm going to do today is just give you a general overview of how it works and what you and ideas about how you can what you can use it for. Um, I'm not going to go into a very great big statistical detail because, you know, you can spend a whole week learning how to do a Mendelian randomization. My objective for today's session is for you all to be able to go away and be able to read a paper and kind of understand what's going on and understand what this little diagram that I have on the top left hand side of the slide represents. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so imagine I have a question where I want to understand whether BMI is causally influencing strength. Okay, so I have several options in terms of study design of how I can answer this question. Can collect data cross sectionally. So, for example, you know, I can come to this group meeting and I can collect everyone's information on their BMI and their grip strength. And I could do a quick graph of it to see how they're related. So, this is going to be super quick. It'll be super easy. Okay. <clears throat> but maybe it's not the best way to study design to answer my question because there could be issues around reverse causality. I mean, in the sense of BMI could influence strength, but strength may influence BMI. Okay, I appreciate that that example is not perfect, but just go with the idea, right? You, when you have two, ex, two an exposure and an outcome measured at the same time, you don't know if X is causing Y or if Y is causing X. You also have issues, for example, about confounding because physical activity will influence BMI and physical activity would influence strength. Um, and so what I can do there is I can go around and ask all of you all how much physical activity you do and adjust for that in my models, okay? But, and that may help, but, you know, there could still be residual confounding because maybe I haven't measured physical activity well enough, or maybe I've not measured all the confounders that I should have. So, for example, maybe I did not, I forgot to ask you all about your smoking status because that can influence both BMI and strength. So <clears throat> there's some issues around um, a cross-sectional data collection. So another thing that I could then do is I can collect information on BMI and strength longitudinally. So today I can come into our group meeting and I can collect your information about BMI. And then next month I can come back and collect your information on grip strength, okay? So that's great because now I have a temporal relationship between my BMI and my grip strength. Um, but it's going to be more expensive and time consuming because I'm going to have to come to this group meeting twice. Yeah. Um, and then also, I love you all though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also the issues around confounding are still going to be there, right? I could still have residual confounding or I could still have unmeasured confounders in this sort of study design. <clears throat> so now I'm a bit stuck. So what else can I do? A third option then would be. Okay, you guys, I'm going to do a randomized control trial on you all because that's a gold standard. So I'll take a third of you all and assign you to a group where I'm going to reduce your BMI. I'll take another third of you all and assign you all to a group where I'm going to increase your BMI. <laughs> and I'll take the last third and I'll just keep you all at a constant BMI. And then I'll measure your group strength in a month's time. But you like, seriously, that's not like ethical or practical or, you know, possible what ethics committee is going to approve that kind of study design even though it's a gold standard like nobody okay so <clears throat> i now have a real problem <clears throat> because i want to ask the question does bmi causally influence strength and i've gone through three different study designs in my head and <clears throat> none of them are ideal or practical in terms of answering my question so i don't know what to do but luckily, statisticians have come up with ideas about creative thinking that allows us to emulate um, randomized control trials. So with a little bit of like um, creative ideas, they, you have different ways of emulating randomized control trials. So one way would be to use causal inference approaches, which we'll talk about another day. But today, we're going to focus on um, <clears throat> Mendelian randomization to emulate a randomized control trial. So what is a Mendelian randomization? So essentially, and I'm really sorry that M for Mendelian should be with a capital M because that's the guy's name. 
Um, but essentially, a Mendelian randomization is where instead of using BMI as my exposure, I'm going to use a proxy of BMI as my exposure. And that proxy is going to be the genetic information that I have on BMI. OK, now this is pretty cool because the genetic variants um, that are going to be used as your proxy for BMI, they are assigned to you randomly at conception. And you've had them from the time you were conceived. So you're going to have no issues around reverse causality or confounding when you look, look using this genetic information as your proxy for BMI. And it's going to be much quicker and easier and more practical than doing a randomized control trial, because frankly, we can't do the randomized control trial we want to answer our research question. <clears throat> so when it comes to BMI in particular, um, a GWAS, which is uh, short for a genome-wide association study, the most recent GWAS have ident has identified about 900 SNPs that are associated with BMI. So <clears throat> what that means then is on average, people who have these different genetic BMI variants will have different BMIs, okay? But they would not differ with respect to other characteristics like smoking and physical activity and so forth. Um, before I go on, does anybody have any questions on that? Um, what's a SNP? Oh my God, um, single nucleotide polymorphism. It's like, right, now this is getting into biology that I'm really not <laughs> um, very good at, but essentially a SNP is like <clears throat> the thing on your chromosome that's either a zero that you know the ATGC thing? Yep. Yeah. So we, right. Okay. So you have the SNPs and they either on or off. So you <laughs> so you have 900 SNPs and if they were all on on average, you'd have a higher BMI. If your 900 SNPs were all, all off, as in they were all assigned value zero, they would, you'd have a lower BMI on average. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you're gonna have a pattern that looks like high BMI and a pattern that looks like low BMI. And you compare yes, exactly. Perfect, exactly, yeah. When, please, please, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer like stats questions, but things like chromosomes, SNPs, and all of that, genes, I, 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 have, I have no idea. In my mind, a SNP binary. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Great. <laughs> That's the level that I can answer at. Okay. So <clears throat> this might also help you here, Jed. I was going to, um, I, I started off the slide by drawing out these beautiful little diagrams to explain to you what um, I mean, the idea behind Mendelian randomization is. But then I found this amazing report written by um, Laura Howe and the group in Bristol. And I was just like, you know what? They've already written this beautiful report. I'm just going to use that to explain it to you because there's no point reinventing the wheel. So <clears throat> imagine in the general population, yeah, you're going to have people in the general population and they're going to have many differences that can confound the relationship between BMI and strength. Um, so for example, some of the people in the population are going to have different levels of physical activity and smoking. Um, and dietary patterns and so forth. And that's represented by these different shapes, okay? <clears throat> but when I sort the general population out according to the genetic propensity for a high BMI, these differences in diet and physical activity and smoking, it's not gonna affect their genetic propensity for having a high or low BMI. Because remember that genetic propensity for having a high or low BMI is assigned to you from at conception, okay? <clears throat> And if we draw a graph of genetic propensity for high BMI against your actual measured and observed BMI, you're going to see that on average, people who have a higher genetic propensity towards high BMI will have higher measured values of BMI. So to emphasize the point here, it's not that your genes are deterministic, it's that on average, people who have the higher genetic propensity for high BMI will have a higher BMI, okay? Um, and so if, an, if then the question is about the relationship between BMI and grip strength, if on average people who have a higher genetic propensity towards a high BMI also have a greater grip strength, then we're actually going to then have evidence that BMI is causally influencing strength because the genetic prop propensity for high BMI is not affected by confounders, yeah, because we're 
as we've shown over here. And it's not affected by grip strength itself because your genes for BMI are happening at conception and your strength is happening, you know, in midlife or something, whenever we've measured it. So that sounds amazing, right? That sounds pretty straightforward. But as with all um, statistical analysis, all statistical analysis have assumptions behind them. And if the assumptions of your statistical analysis are not met, then you have to question the results of your statistical analysis. So it's really important anytime you do a statistical analysis to check the underlying assumptions and check how robust your answers are to whether your assumptions are satisfied or not. So when it comes to Mendelian randomization, there are three main assumptions um, that underlie the Mendelian randomization. Depending on the type of Mendelian randomization you do, there are a couple extra assumptions um, that you also need to consider. But for the purposes of this talk, we're just going to focus on the three main assumptions, okay? So the first one, and in my opinion, the easiest one to check. Ooh, oh yeah. So the first one that's probably the easiest one to check is to that your genetic genes are associated with your exposure. So that your SNPs are associated with BMI in our case, yeah? And that's the easiest assumption to check because usually you get your SNPs for your exposure from a GWAS. So, you know, you have all these genome-wide association studies for BMI that have identified 900 independent SNPs that are associated with BMI. So that's quite a straightforward assumption to check, generally speaking. Next assumption is that your genetic variants are not directly associated with your outcome. So the SNPs that affect BMI, they're not directly affecting strength. The only way that my SNP can affect strength would be through BMI. Yeah, there's no direct relationship between my SNPs and my and strength. And finally, the third assumption then is that my genetic variants are not associated with potential confounders. So the SNPs that are my proxy for BMI, they're not going to be associated with things like physical activity, smoking, social club, and so forth. Now, for each of these um, uh, assumptions, there are several different checks and sens sensitivity analyses that you can do to assess the robustness of your assumptions. So, which is good because you can do your Mendelian randomization. You can check the robustness of your findings against these assumptions. And if your findings are robust, you probably are in a much better position to talk about um, whether your, your exposure is causally affecting your outcome. Okay. So there are some things to note when you want to do a Mendelian randomization. First, the first is that um, the effects of SNP. Sorry, can um can 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 um you'll just mute your mics because it's a bit distracting. I'm I'm just doing that for you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So there are a couple of things to note about Mendelian randomization. Um, and the first is that the effect of your SNPs on your exposure, they tend to be small. Genetic effects tend to be small. So the upshot of that to ensure that you have enough power to do your analysis is that you need to have a large sample size, okay? And so that's where studies like UK Biobank come into their own. Now, I don't know if any of you all know about UK Biobank, but UK Biobank is essentially a data set where there's genetic information and phenotypic information on over half a million people in this country, which is like amazing, okay? But on the other hand, UK Biobank is a selected population because the people in UK Biobank generally are better off um, and non-smokers and have higher social class and so forth than the general UK population. So there are um, selection bias issues when you use these kinds of data sets that you need to think about. Also, Mendelian randomization estimates, estimates a lifetime effect. So for our question of interest, we'd be getting the lifetime effect of BMI on strength. And in some instances, that can be useful. So for example, if you're thinking about the relationship between you know, chronic low-grade inflammation and heart disease, you probably want to look at the lifetime effect of chronic low-grade inflammation and heart disease. 
but for like course epidemiologists, they're interested, for example, in understanding whether BMI and BMI gain at specific periods in your life are particularly detrimental for subsequent health. And so Mendelian randomization probably is not that useful when you want to think about critical periods of your life. And we'll return to that point a little bit later on. So this is the most statsy uh, slide I'm going to show you for the whole presentation, OK? So this is basically a really rough and ready idea of how you would do a Mendelian randomization. And at the most basic level, what you're going to do is you're going to regress your SNPs on your exposure, and you get a bunch of coefficients. So you're going to take from your GWAS yeah, the SNPs that are related to BMI. And you don't even actually need to have any individual data here. But you look in the supplementary section of your GWAS, and they will have a table of the relationship between your SNP and your BMI. And you get those coefficients, and you put them into an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Then what you need to do is you need to regress those exact same SNPs on your outcome of interest. So you regress those exact same SNPs on um, grip strength. And then you get these new betas of the relationship between your SNP on your grip strength, and you put that in your Excel spreadsheet. And then essentially what you're going to be doing is you're going to be calculating the ratio of these two coefficients for each SNP. And then you're combining those um, ratios together in the same way that you would do a meta-analysis. And that is essentially how you do a Mendelian randomization. And something that really blew my mind when um, I started thinking about Mendelian randomization is that actually there are instances where you can do a Mendelian randomization without even having any individual level data on your computer. So you can get the relationship between your SNP and your exposure from a GWAS for your exposure, OK? Then you can find a GWAS for your outcome, and you can get the relationship between the exact same SNPs and your outcome from the GWAS for your outcome. And you can calculate this ratio. And it's amazing, because you can do this without having any individual level data on your computer. And it makes it amazingly accessible on the one hand. On the other hand, um, some of the sensitivity analysis and assumption checks I talked about earlier are not really possible to do when you do a Mendelian randomization in this way. But I just wanted to highlight that it is possible to do a Mendelian randomization without actually having any individual level data on your computer. So back to my question right at the beginning of this talk, where I was asking, does BMI causally influence strength? Okay, so here's a graph of what, what I found in men. So this here, this model one, is just the relationship between BMI and strength when I adjust for age in an observational model. Here I'm adjusting for age, so social class, smoking, and physical activity in an observational model. And here, this is my estimate from my Mendelian randomization. And what this estimate from the Mendelian randomization is saying is that Per standard deviation increase in BMI, um, grip strength is increasing by 0.5 kilos in men. So the long and short of that is when I look at this graph and I notice that my ob observed models and my Mendelian randomization are in the same direction and kind of in the same magnitude range, I'm relatively confident in saying, okay, yeah, I think that there's a causal effect of BMI on, on strength in men. So as your BMI increases, your strength is increasing in men. OK, so that's, that's pretty cool. But what's going on in women then? So in women, when I just adjust for age, where per standard deviation increase in BMI, my strength is actually decreasing. Okay, But then when I adjust for age, social class, smoking, physical activity, the, the um, relationship is actually in the other direction. Yeah. And then with the Mendelian randomization, again, the relationship is in the opposite direction. So the Mendelian randomization is saying per standard deviation increase in BMI, my strength in women is decreasing. And so now when I look at this in women, I, what can I say? Well, to be honest, I would say that there's inconsistent evidence of a relationship between BMI and strength in women. 
And you just contrast that with what's happening in men. In men, all my points are skewed from the same direction and I have confidence in what's going on. Whereas in women, like, I really don't know. And, you know, you can do a study and you can say, I really don't know, there's inconsistent evidence. And I think that that's fine. And actually, I think people should say that more often. Um, the other thing then is, remember I said one of the things about Mendelian randomization is that it gives you a lifetime effect of BMI on strength. So what I wanted to do then was ask the question, well, is the relationship between BMI and strength stable over your lifetime? So what we did was we stratified the association between BMI and strength by age and sex. And if we just focus on males, which is this top line up here, yeah, we can see that in men who were less than 50 years old, per standard deviation increase in BMI, your grip strength was increasing by about 1.2 kilos. But by the time they were 65, per standard deviation increase in BMI, your grip strength was increasing by about 0.3. And I really wish I had the information to see what's going on, you know, in men who were 80 plus, for example, because the relationship obviously isn't stable across age. And I think what's happening here is when you're a young, say when you're a young man and you have a little bit excess body fat and you move around and you walk up some stairs or you just walk to the shops or whatever, yeah, that little bit of excess body fat is providing you with a loading stim stimulus. Okay, so you have this constant loading stimulus. And so you're actually, anytime you move, you're increasing your strength. But as you get older and you probably get a little bit fatter and this chronic low grade inflammation that you've had probably has been there for a longer portion of your life, the negative effects of that chronic low grade inf inflammation are probably overriding the beneficial effects of the loading effect that was provided when you were young. And so the relationship actually does change with age. And so that leads quite nicely to this slide where I think you need to think about the bigger picture when you think about Mendelian randomization. Because I think Mendelian randomization is amazing. I, where it can be used to answer questions that you can't otherwise answer, but I don't think it's the only method available to you. I think it's one of several tools that you should use to help understand causal links between your exposures and your outcomes. And there are other tools that are also available to you, like randomized control trials, syst uh, systematic reviews, causal inference methods, and so forth. And they just all, they all work together because they all have different strengths and assumptions um, to try and answer the same question. And so if, if nothing else, this is the most important slide of my talk, okay, guys? And I've just put up here some useful resources about Mendelian randomization. They go from like a two minute video all the way up to, you know, a BMJ podcast of 30 minutes that are worth listening to. The, I would say that if you all are interested in Mendelian randomization, there are two groups that are worth um, following the work that they do. So there's a group in Bristol that do a lot of Mendelian randomization work. And there's a group in the biostats units in Cambridge that also do it. And they make some, especially the group in Bristol, they make some very accessible material um, of, on Mendelian randomization for the general, population, uh, general public to read and understand. And that's all that I had to say. And if you'll have any questions, now would be a good time to ask.